You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Over the past 20 years, charges of inefficiency and ineffectiveness by Cincinnati city government have steadily increased. Recently, charges of outright corruption facilitated by political connections have emerged. Though common in many cities, Cincinnati has been remarkably free of this kind of problem since the charter reforms of 1924. The heart of the controversy revolves around the Empire Theater debacle. In 2001, Council approved uh, 228000 in loans and grants for LaShawn Pettis Brown, a basketball player and would-be developer, to restore the Empire Theater in Over the Rhine. Brown and the money skipped town. The original draft of an internal audit of the deal uh, completed in October charged that members of the mayor and the manager's staff exercised improper influence on the Community Development Office. But as 12 News reporter Rich Jaffe revealed last week, the fate of the report at the hands of the city manager's staff has only compounded the problem. When the internal audit manager was satisfied with the review of what was supposed to be done to the building that once stood here, he submitted what he thought was his final report for approval. That report then underwent eight more revisions. And when he finally got it back from the city manager's office, his 10-page report had been shortened by three entire pages. In fact, it didn't even have his name on it anymore. Missing were things like specific references to assistant city managers and comments like the one saying, had council members been given a full report, it's unlikely they would have voted for the project. In the meeting today, the finance director who works for the city manager and was the supervisor of the audit said the changes came from Valerie Lemmy's office. I think there was a concern on her part not uh, to go overboard on being particularly critical or making comments involving the mayor and city council. But the city manager says she simply offered guidance. And I didn't offer any specifics. I didn't do any editing. I didn't do any underlining. Uh, I left that to the responsibility of the people whose task it was, Bill and his audit team, uh, to make certain that the audit was credible. So it was never any intent on my part or anybody else's part to hide any information. There's still references there to the mayor and members of council. But while auditors say the significant issues indeed remained, they and others worry about too much city control. The internal audit committee of the city consists of five people, three members of council and two outside members who have corporate audit experience. That committee has been calling for reform of the internal audit function for months, only to be frustrated by the administration. I am joined this morning by David Crowley, a member of the Cincinnati City Council and a member of the Internal Audit Commission committee, I guess, and Pat DeWine, who's also a member of council and a member of the audit committee. I have asked Rita McNeil, the city solicitor, or someone from the administration to join us, but they declined. Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to the Hi, Dan. I'd like to begin by reading something from um, a motion that the two of you signed and submitted on March the 18th, 2003. And I think it's important that that date be remembered. And in this, it's a proposal to reform the internal audit function. You make a statement and it says, in the wake of Enron, WorldCom, and other corporate accounting scandals, businesses across the country are trying to create a strong, independent internal audit function. Yet, in this year's budget, the city did just the opposite. It took away the independence of the city's internal auditor and made it a part of the budget office. The auditor now reports to the people he is supposed to be watching. Do we have a case here where the city is running in the opposite direction of everybody else in the country and the chickens have just come home to roost? I think we, I think we do. I mean, we, you know, we are, everyone else seems to think that, we, everyone else is trying to add more checks and balances so there's some independence and, you know, we, so, some real accountability. We're doing just the opposite. You know, the limited uh, checks and balances that, that, that we had, uh, have, have been taken away. Last, last year in the budget, the city manager got rid of the independence of the internal audit office. This year, she's getting, she's getting rid of uh, independent OMI that used to conduct investigations of the city administration. So there's going to be no checks or balances. Dave, yeah. how independent was it before this last, what you were referencing there in that? Well, for years, it's been in the city manager's office until this past January 2003 when it was reorganized again and it was put into the budget or the finance office. 
uh, but it's never been completely independent. It's always been reported to the city, city manager. And, and I, I just like to point out, Dan, that Pat and I started on this effort for more independence long before these recent scandals. And that's had. why I wanted to yeah, make that yeah. date clear. Even, even before March of, uh, of uh, March 18th, we had started looking at this probably in the fall of 2002 uh, for the, with the idea. And we looked uh, at other cities and how it's done. And some cities have independently elected auditors. Uh, and some have very, very, you know, buried, very controlled auditors. So, we're you, in March, you made a specific proposal uh, in this motion. What is the core of that proposal? What's the key thing you would like to see? I think, I think the, the key thing is that we would have a separate audit committee uh, that the internal audit would, that includes some outside people with, with, with some audit experience that, that w the audit manager would prepare the reports directly to it. So instead of going to the city manager, being edited by the city manager, being control they, they would go to the independent audit committee. Yeah, your proposal G is the internal auditor shall provide all completed reports and audits directly to the internal audit committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Given where we are right at the moment, that seems to be exactly the crux of the problem. Well, it, it, what, what I'm concerned about more than anything else, there's different mechanisms we can use, but we want to get to transparency and we want to get to confidence in city government. I mean, that, those, are the, those are the very important elements that I think we can structure it different ways, but that we ought to have, when we issue an audit, the, the public ought to be able to say, yes, this is good, this is, we have confidence in this, and even if the report is, is citing a bunch of poor management procedures or whatever, at least the, the citizens can say, well, city council is on it, now I'll go ahead and do something about reforming. Well, the administration, um, through the manager and through Rita McNeil, who's the city solicitor, mm -hmm. which means the, the city's chief legal advisor, um, have raised all sorts of issues with your proposal, mm -hmm. saying that it, it gives council powers that the charter doesn't give the council, that it removes powers that the manager ought to have under the charter, um, it, it raises a whole series of these. What what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I think I think it's, this, this this is a case where you know, the law, the lawyers are, are are being used to avoid doing something the administration doesn't want to do. I mean, we we've you know we've done some independent legal analysis, uh, and it's pretty clear. One, our charter says very clearly the council has the authority to go to go out and hire hire auditors if we if we want to do that. Um, and, but the second thing is what we're asking for is very much like. Uh, other parts of city government, just like the Citizens Complaint Authority, where there, where there is um, a, a separate s board and there, there is a, an investigator who's part of city government who prepares the reports directly for the outside board, not edited by the city manager. That's, mm -hmm. that's all we want. It's the same thing we've done. Two members areas. of that Citizens Complaint Authority were on this show last week to mm -hmm. talk about that process, and that's one of the things that I know you've pointed out before, mm -hmm. that the manager agreed to recently setting that up, mm -hmm. and you're saying the model for what you're proposing is exactly the same? I think it is. It's very similar. And, and, and there may be some uniquenesses that we need to tweak. And, and, uh, but what, what's happening, we're not getting a proposed ordinance, which is what we asked for, that we can even debate with our fellow council members. Um, so, I mean, we need to get to that point. We need to get this coming forward. You, you made the motion. They responded in writing ultimately, and it took a long time, as I see it, months right. and months. Um, and now, in fact, this is coming back at a very time when now there's controversy yeah. about all of this, mm -hmm. rather than doing it in an uh, expeditious way. Besides these written communications, are you all talking together behind the scenes and trying to resolve this? Are Pat and I talking? Not, no, no, you and right, Pat, that's yeah. easy. Uh, we, <laughs> with the we, we, ha we have been, in, in fact, the solicitor was even at the, it was, it was at the law committee last week trying mm -hmm. to get her to do this. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I have talked to the manager about, you know, what my intentions are, what our intentions are. And, 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 I, and I feel, Dan, uh, that the manager is, is not, I don't feel the manager is stonewalling, but I, I feel that she's going about this in a, in a, a, a kind of a hesitancy, you know, kind of hesitatingly. And I, but I do believe that she's willing to work something out with us now. We don't have anything on the table, but I do believe that we'll get a, we'll get a proposed ordinance from the solicitor's office uh, by next week, I would expect. Or, Is uh, that what soon. you're expecting? Are you uh, expecting an ordinance? We, we've been waiting since March 18th, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not I'm optimistic. I'm a little more optimistic than uh, Pat is. If you don't get that, could you go outside? I mean, Pat, you're a lawyer. Right. Mm -hmm. Could you draft 
the language of the ordinance yourself or get help? That's, I, I, think, I think that's all we'll, we'll have to do is, yeah. you know, if, if, if they continue to, to refuse even to draft yeah. the ordinance, it's go, it's go out and, and hire, a, hire a law firm yeah. to do it. And I've had contacts from people in the community, business people, who say, you're on the right track, this is the way the city should be going. Uh, you know, we've learned from Enron and WorldCom and others, Let, let's, be, let's be transparent and let's be um, objective and uh, let's go in this direction. So I, I think we'll get kind of, you know, uh, technical help and uh, political help that, that we'll need on this. Where is the mayor on this? Uh, the mayor seems to be against it. He was uh, he was quoted in the, in the against paper, uh, against 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 your proposal. Yes, mm -hmm. he was quoted in the paper criticizing it, it the other day. And do you think that's because the immediate situation, his office is taking a hit on the Empire Theater in, in the original draft of uh, that was done? Uh, you know, I I hate to think that's the motivation, mm -hmm. but 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 certainly. Uh, you know, so, so some of some of the things that have came out about the mayor's office in the, in the Empire Theater were very damaging. Mm -hmm. Dave, you're in you're in the same political party, yeah. Unlike Pat, uh, well, have I, you talked to Charlie about this? Have I talked to him? I have not talked to him in, in any depth. No, uh -huh. I have not. Um, but you know, I, I I have no problem about talking to Charlie about it. I I I feel if Charlie's got any hesitancy, it's more related to. Keeping the keeping the charter and violet and 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 um, more along the lines that you know we're we're tinkering with the charter and and we're trying not to we're trying to do this in that in a way that's consistent and and under under the charter provisions. You know, one of the things that uh, you know, the, the the basic issue here is control of the manager over the audit function. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened last week when Rich Jaffe was doing his story, he got. <coughs> called down to do an interview with uh, the manager and there's an exchange in that that's it's the raw tape but I'd like you to watch this I'd like for people to see it it's rough it's not the sort of thing that normally gets aired but I'd like for people to see the exchange that takes place here um, I think that the concern was that very simply the internal audit committee should get the report simultaneously with the city manager forgive me you yourself said in there I have <clears> it on <throat> tape that you believe that the city manager's concern was in regards to controlling comments that were being made about the mayor and city council. And what I said was that the internal audit uh, function has no authority to audit by law, by administrative code, the mayor and members of city council. Now what you said was that after your <clears throat> discussions with the city manager that you believed she was concerned about those comments. Yes, I said that. I, I said that she was concerned because the internal audit function does not audit city council, does not audit the mayor. And what was in the draft report was not substantiated, was not substantiated through interview with, with the mayor, mayor staff, council members, council members. Okay. So again, we're just trying to get a good quality product that's consistent with what good business practices are that makes sense, that is appropriate and applicable to findings. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to cover up anything. Were there legitimate points being made there or was this a matter of Mueller having his story being twisted from the morning till the afternoon? It seemed like a lot of spin was going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that Bill, uh, was what he said here, his, what he said was the, the manager's concern was for the fact that the audit co function committee has no authority over council or the mayor. And he's saying a good audit would have allowed, if in fact that was going to be the way, and that area would have allowed for response from them. Okay. This is such an important issue for the long-term health of this city. We're going to be stay with this and we'll have you back Good. as this develops because uh, this, is, this is just too important. Thank yeah. you for being Thank here you. this morning. Stay tuned. After the break, the county commissioners have to decide by this Wednesday whether or not to allow the Cincinnati Museum Center to ask voters for an operating support levy. I think that we are making such a very small request that if you have to make hard choices, which elected officials have to do, we're one of the choices that seem to be very affordable and very reasonable. It's like ducks nibbling at you. You know, it's just a little bite, but eventually all those little nibbles become a huge, huge bite. And that's what's happened with property taxes in this county.
the Cincinnati Museum Center, it's become a financial struggle to keep all the balls in the air. The center, home to the Children's Museum, plus science and history attractions, is Ohio's most visited museum, one million tourists a year. But the Union Terminal building is old and costly. The center wants Hamilton County commissioners to put a tax levy on the ballot next spring. No levy, museum officials say. The center as we know it could not exist. Welcome back. That's the way 12 News reporter Jeff Hirsch recently framed the question facing the Hamilton County commissioners this coming week. Will they allow voters in March to decide whether or not to impose a new tax to help defray the operating cost of the Cincinnati Museum Center? The Museum Center is requesting a two-tenths of a mill levy that would generate $3.6 million a year and would cost the owner of a house valued at $100,000 approximately $6 a year. To discuss this proposal and the decision faced by the commissioners this week, I am joined by Doug McDonald, the president of the Cincinnati Museum Center, and Chris Finney, a member of the Tax Levy Review Committee that looked over this. Good morning, and and Good morning. both of you, welcome back to Newsmakers. You've both been on. You always seem to come on for tax issues, Chris. What, what was the role of the Review Commission in this process? Because it's been beefed up. And explain what you, your commission has done. The Tax Levy Review Committee, I think, was formed about a decade ago, and as you say, over the years, its role has been beefed up. But it used to be that uh, someone who wanted a tax would just go to the three commissioners and say, you know, we'd like to be on the ballot, and if two of them said yes, they would be, and they didn't, because the commission is so small, they couldn't, they typically didn't form a subcommittee and do an extensive study or anything like that. And the idea of the Tax Levy Review Committee is that we need to be more thoughtful about uh, exactly whether something goes to the voters and at what uh, amount. And essentially, that's what the Tax Levy Review Committee makes a recommendation to the commissioners on, is uh, whether something is worthy of appearing before the voters, and if so, uh, at what dollar amount uh, we think it's appropriate for and In this particular case, you now actually contract with outside auditing firms to come in and audit organizations that are asking for, uh, for money. Is that's that correct? Right. Commissioner Heimlich, when he came in, this is one of the... Uh, uh, things that he enacted. We actually did uh, a, a, a much less intensive study uh, uh, for most of the time of the Tax Labor Review Committee, but this year it's, it's been expanded. And so uh, Drake Hospital and the Museum Center this year went through uh, extensive audits, as did the zoo uh, last year from, uh, two of them went through A.T. Hudson, and then the Museum Center was through a company called Maxim. And you know, they produced a, a rather extensive report, and in the case of the Museum Center, uh, we're very praiseful of their operations, saying with a few exceptions of some things that they could fix, they were operated efficiently uh, and that they had a fairly dire financial need uh, that needed to be addressed. Doug, you, you were on the other end of this. You were being yeah. audited. Was this a thorough audit? Did you all have to do a lot of work to, to, to meet the demands of the auditors? Well, we, we did a lot of work to do that, but we welcomed the audit. We felt like when you're asking for public funds, you really uh, should expect to have a rigorous examination and everything that you do should be looked at and it should be looked at intensely and they did that we we felt like our goal was to be forthcoming and to provide all the information that they requested they came back saying that you operate very leanly and and actually under what the norm would be uh, and found very few things some things about parking revenues and maybe some uh, how to f finance some of the bonds right. that you could save some money. But other than that, they basically were saying that you are operating in a unfavorable environment compared to other institutions similar to you. Is that correct? They found that most museums in the country, ninety percent of the museums in the country do have some level of public funding and we don't. And so we were definitely in the minority there. And also they found that the amount of money we were spending was by far below what most museums serving our population and also looking at the cost of Union Terminal, uh, they found the expenses there was far below what they would have expected for the, that size of facility. You know, that's one of the things, Chris or Doug, either one of you, that is not only a huge facility, it's an old facility. It was a facility built before utility bills cost an arm and a leg. And a lot of the cost that uh, is being asked for in this tax levy proposal is to deal with the, the maintenance and ongoing operation of that building, which I might like point out is still publicly owned. It's still owned by the city of Cincinnati. Is that correct? 
Oh, actually, that became a question during our deliberations, and I'm not sure we have a good answer, but I think it's owned by the county uh, uh, initially, and they lease it to a city-county corporation, which then leases it to the museum center. Is that right? It's, it's, it's owned by the city, but then the county owns the improvements and, oh, okay. but the, of, the, of the facility because of the bond issue in 87, and, it's, and there's a joint entity that has appointments from the city and the county and the museum center that actually is the controlling board. So it still is very much a public building. But Dan, I think the important thing uh, about, in addition to recommending the amount of the levy, one of the things the Tax Levy Review Committee can do is to put limitations or recommendations in there. And the Museum Center has been very clear that uh, they um, uh, only need this at most for two terms or the 10-year cycle. And so we said we want that. But in terms of the building, uh, what we said was at the end of that 10-year period of time, we want an endowment fund in place so that the current millage that's on for the building and the new millage that's for the building and operations will all go away and that they'll be self-sustaining completely from that point forward. When you say two cycles, normally these are five-year cycles, so you're saying that you would expect them to have this levy on two times. Why doesn't the museum center just go out and raise that endowment right now? We would love to do that, and we can if we're successful in getting this levy, but but major donors won't make large gifts unless they know the institution is financially secure. And the problem we have right now is everybody knows that the museum is not financially secure. It's very much at risk. And with the institution being a risk, then people are saying, well, if I'm going to make a major personal gift, then how long is that going to last? And if, you're op if your, cash flow, your negative cash flow is a million seven, a million eight a year, they go, well, if I give a million dollars, it's gone in a year. That didn't really help much. So what we need to do is stop the bleeding we stop the bleeding, then we can start to build an endowment, and people will then see that as a long-term investment. People don't give to short-term fixes, they give to long-term investments. And they especially don't like to pay for old debt. Right. Um, that's a nice image. The 10 years, two cycles, everything goes off at that point, we have the endowment. Should the voter believe a promise like that, though? Should, and you're the skeptical one here, right. Chris. Uh, when you are asking people to believe that model, even the commissioners, as they come up on this vote on Wednesday, can you expect that to really happen? Or once, once an organization gets public money, does it keep it forever? I don't, I don't think I can predict, and Doug can't predict what's going to happen 10 years from now. Um, but the, I think the, the issue is what kind of commitment are we making? We see in the tax business uh, entities come in and they say, well, gee, we've been doing, and we, we saw this with Drake Hospital this year, they say, we've been doing this for 25 years, and the com community has made a commitment to do this forever. Uh, I said, well, where is that in writing? I have not seen that I made a commitment to do this forever, and I don't think anybody else has either. Uh, but in the case of the Museum Center, we have gone to the extent, and I hope the commissioners adopt this, and Doug McDonald has encouraged us to do this, to memorialize the fact that there is no obligation or commitment beyond the 10 years, and in addition to that, to, uh, to emphasize that we expect them not to be back at the end of the 10 years, that it's their obligation to become self-sufficient during that period of time. And then in addition to that, uh, at the two and a half year period, the five year period, and so on, uh, there's going to be mid-year reviews, mid-term reviews, so that we can see if they're on target. So we've given them, or they're going to create specific goals so that at the end of that cycle they will be. Now, will that happen? I don't know, but that is, if you talk about commitment, that's the only commitment we're making at this time. Now one of the things I, I, I mentioned to you that I used that little sound bite from Phil Heimlich at the end of the last one about nibbling. This is a small, very small request. Uh, but it is, you know, one of the com concerns has been there's lots of little small requests that uh, get put together for the taxpayer. What's your answer to that? Even, you know, yes, it's small, but what about that thing about ducks nibbling? Well, in reality, there aren't a lot of really small levies out there. Our levy is so much smaller than all the rest of them that, that ours uh, truly is the smallest that's been asked for in 50 years. So um, you know, it's a great analogy, but it's simply not accurate. If you look at the other special purpose levies, with the exception of the zoo, most of them are much, much larger than ours is. And if you look at any other, any other taxing entity, so ours truly is small. Um, it's, it's a nice analogy, but it's, it's not accurate. And also, there's a number of levies that have been, uh, that are being reduced right now that sort of, I, I, we're, I'm almost out of time. Last week, two commissioners voted to 
push this forward till this coming week? Three. Th did all three? All three. So do you expect this to pass on Wednesday? I'm an eternal optimist, but I'm a pragmatist. We, uh, next Wednesday will be the test, and the commissioners are at least taking this very seriously, which we, which we appreciate. And one last thing I want to point out is your committee uh, voted unanimously to support this, right? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll watch this on Wednesday, and then if this passes, you'll be back uh, leading up to March to talk about this. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women shaping our community for the future. Have a good week. It's been a very challenging two years for the Muslims and uh, the report.